thank you for watching this lecture. It's the first in a series of lectures that normally are delivered to a live audience. Due to the COVID-19, we were pushed to go ahead and take this lectureship online, and we pray that it will still be beneficial to each one. There are many people, perhaps, that are going to be watching this particular lecture or the series of lectures and wonder, why are we studying an examination of religious history from 17 to 1900? Now, if you've been with us since 2018, when we first started this uh, series, then you would be pretty familiar with why. But I want to back up and give an understanding just in case you, don't, you haven't been following the whole process. See, I've been preaching full time for over 18 years. And one of the questions that I get over and over and over again is people wanting to understand why are there so many different religions? Or where did denominationalism come from? Many people question about religious confusion. In fact, many people actually dismiss religion altogether because there is so much chaos or confusion in religion. And they ask me, and they're inquisitive, and the hearts of the people, I believe, are very sincere in wanting to know why there's one person over here that would call himself a Baptist and another person over here calling themselves a Methodist. How can Christianity and Judaism both continue to exist at one time? And why do you have these terms like Protestantism that differ so much from Catholicism? When I became director of the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies, the first year I had inherited a lectureship that was designed by Sidney White. He had done all the work. All I had to do was to see it through. But the next year, it was my responsibility as director of the school and director of the lectureship to come up with a, a lectureship theme. It's with this in mind I began to start surveying people and trying to inquire what they would find interesting. Once again, this interest in where did the denominations come from, why is there religious confusion, kept resurfacing over and over again. I contemplated perhaps uh, each year focusing on just one denomination or one religious organization and have a whole series of lectures just focusing upon it. However, as I contemplated it more, I was afraid that people would perceive that as trying to isolate out and, and pick on certain religious groups. And that wasn't my goal, as our goal is only to teach the gospel and to give understanding to people so that they can better follow after Christ. And so as I began to think about it even further and to continue to think, okay, how can we do this? I thought about how about we start with that there is a church and that church is established and then to notice what happens following that. And so what happened was we had in 2018 the very first lecture to, that would come around and I talked about the importance of studying history. Because a lot of people when I first announced this series thought, oh no, history. Who wants to go listen to history? And I kind of get that other than I actually enjoy history. I watch a lot of documentaries and I, I do a lot of studies in history. But I realize that at times it could be rather boring. And so the first lecture that I presented in 2018 was the importance of studying history. And we talked about that when we understand history, we can understand where we've come from. We can see the things that we have done right, along with the things that have been executed poorly, so that we don't, we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, but instead we can repeat the things that we do right. And then Brother Kenneth Burleson followed me that morning and on a Sunday in 2018, and he preached a sermon, and the sermon or the lecture that he presented was that the church was established and is maintainable. And that is the premise. And we have to understand that if I'm going to introduce the concept of the restoration period or the restoration movement, then we have to understand that there is that which is understood as the church or known as the church. Now, if we go to Ephesians chapter 5, we would understand that the church is actually the body of Jesus Christ. We can back up and realize in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus would explain to his apostles this concept of the church and the kingdom. Now this was a constant struggle that he had with his disciples because they were busy looking for an earthly kingdom. 
They were looking for him to take the throne. That's what they were following after him, thinking would be established, even to the point that in Matthew chapter 23, 24, 25, he, he's, you actually have him trying to straighten his disciples out once again that his kingdom's not of this world because they were busy looking all around at the, the temple and the, the buildings that existed in Jerusalem, thinking that when Jesus took the throne, these would now be his. But his emphasis was that it's a spiritual kingdom. But going back to Matthew 16 that I referred to a moment ago, it's here that Jesus would say, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. But upon this rock, the rock that Jesus was referring to was the great confession that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's upon this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. Now, Dr. Bells, or James Bells, as many people have read his works and are familiar with him, would write a book and he refers to Acts chapter 2 as being the hub of the Bible. That perhaps could be debated because you can't have the establishment of the church in Acts chapter 2 without the coming of Jesus that we read of in the gospel accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Perhaps they ought to be considered the hub of the Bible. But the reason he made that statement was because if you look before Acts chapter 2, the church is always spoken of as something that is going to come, something that is in the future. Just like in Matthew 16 we notice, I will build my church. But there's an important phrase that we find in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 because it's here that we see for the first time the church being spoken of as being in existence. It's here that it says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. No longer is it something that is to be in the future, but it's now spoken of in present tense. In fact, if you go to the book following Acts, you come to the epistle to the Romans that was written by the Apostle Paul. And he writes it to the church at Rome. The same to be with book, the books of Ephesians, uh, Philippians. He refers to the church that, that meets in the homes in those books. The book of Revelation, we are very familiar with at the beginning, we'll talk about the concept and idea that you have uh, the seven churches of Asia. Certainly we have the church universal, the body of Jesus Christ, but we have the local congregation referred to as the church there. But from Acts chapter 2 on, what we have is the church having been established. And the question comes is, is it maintainable? And I'm not going to go into every lecture from previous years. I encourage you to go to YouTube and actually view these past lectures as they are available. Or you can contact the school for a DVD set. But Kenneth Burleson did an excellent job saying, yes, it is maintainable, but it is only maintainable when we go to the authority of what Jesus, as the head of the church, Ephesians chapter 5, tells it to do. After Ken's lesson, I asked Brother Jimmy Bates, to present us a lecture that talked about the early departures from the church. Now when we think about the early departures, or even I think we may have used the title New Testament departures, because it, we don't even see the close of the um, New Testament. We don't even get to the end of it before we actually start to see departures. You have those like Hymenius. You have uh, the case of the Diotrephes, and that he wanted the preeminence of the church. You have people that have left the gospel, it says, in order to be able to return unto their old ways. And so from very early on, we see a problem that happens. We have people that identify the church. They want to be a part of the church, but they leave the authority of the church very early on. Now, as that lectureship progressed, we noticed a lot of things because sometimes we forget things don't happen in a vacuum. We wanted to look at it from a broader perspective. And as we did so, Jeff Bates uh, dealt with the destruction of Jerusalem. And as he did so, that was a lecture that just stuck out in my mind through ever since he, I listened to him preach it because he talked about the words that Jesus would say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And, and with his knowledge that he had to know of the devastation that would come, but the devastation came because Judaism should have ended with the establishment of the church. Remember, 
God's desire was that there would no longer be Jew nor Greek, male nor female. He's not saying that there wouldn't be male or female physically or there wouldn't be a, a Jewish people. Uh, they cannot change their genealogy, but they are all one in Christ Jesus. We are not supposed to be divided in that body. That's what 1 Corinthians talks about because God desires unity. But there were so many Jews that rejected and then there were those that were a part of New Testament Christianity but returned to the ways of Judaism that what you actually have is uh, the Jewish people trying to continue on but with the destruction of Jerusalem actually made it an impossibility because what ended up taking place was that the records would be destroyed in that destruction. There in that process, it made it impossible to be able to continue to keep the ways of Judaism the way God had prescribed it to them in the law of Moses. We actually saw after that, and an excellent job was done by, by several speakers, that they examined Judaism through a period of years following the New Testament um, years, and to see that they would go into areas of Mesopotamia. Great effort was put forth that produced the Babylonian Talmud that was to preserve their ways of trying to follow after uh, the Torah uh, or the Pentateuch. But it wasn't what God desired, and so God allowed the continued oppression and punishment uh, no matter where those people went. We also see the rise of the Islamic faith. And when we think about that, the, uh, I found it intriguing to learn that Muhammad had actually seen Islam to be a religion to bring together Juda Judaism and Christianity. But those lectures that were presented uh, by David Hester as well as Jason Hilburn that year showed us that that's not truth, that Muhammad is a, and was a false prophet that he was not sent from God, and it was not designed by God to, to bring them together as, um, under Islam. It was just a false religion. It's also when we started to see the digression away from truth when they left from the Word of God and started looking to ecumenical councils. David Warren uh, presented a lecture along with Larry Montgomery examining these, some of these ecumenical councils gave them a great task because numerous ones were held. But we saw the hypocrisy that man brought into religion in the name of Christianity and the name of the church, but brought hypocrisy teaching for doctrines of God, the doctrines of men. And so we see this digression slipping further and further away from the truth. I remember Brian Cook that year brought a lesson to us dealing with the idea of Martianism. And we had another lesson dealing with Montanism. Uh, and, and, you know, we think about these teachings where people started actually just coming up with their own writings, trying to say that they were of God, even though they, they no longer were. And they started chopping apart the Bible so that they could make it say what they wanted it to say. But what we're seeing is just a digression away. It's actually uh, some lessons that we had in which we saw that in Catholicism you had a man-made head of the quote-unquote church. Uh, I, I use that loosely because while the church, I believe, has always existed from its establishment, I think in there are periods of time it, became, it digressed so much it could be hard to identify it. Certainly books like Traces of the Kingdom and others have done an excellent job trying to show us how it has always existed in some form somewhere, but what many people were referring to as the church was no longer the church, especially when they put a man as the head of it after Ephesians 5 tells us so clearly that Christ is the head of the church. You don't read of a, a pope in the New Testament. You don't see of that position anywhere. We, should, we saw these lessons that brought forth in that lectureship where uh, they create a system of cardinals that you don't find in the New Testament. What ends up happening, and Robert Alexander, I believe it was, that examined Constantine's influence upon Christianity because you started seeing politics and Christianity being mixed. And, and, and let me say, when, when Christians look to the government to try and carry out the work of the church is never a good thing. 
God has not, does not need government to carry out his will. He needs the church to. But Constantine's influence upon religion and uh, how that brought about the concept of buildings and, uh, and the located buildings for the meeting places of the church, it led to a relocation of the capital, which led to eventually the establishment of the Vatican City. Uh, it's during this time that you end up with a split that would take place. And we had a lesson that talked about the Great Schism. And that's whenever you have the Greek Orthodox and Catholicism parting ways. Now, with that being said, let me make sure I point this out, is that I believe both of them to have already departed from New Testament Christianity. And there's other movements that were going on as well. And we had lessons about Neo-Nestorianism because there were a lot of movements taking place that showed the digression from the church that Jesus said he would build. 2019, to fast forward a little bit, we picked up and we dealt with roughly 15 to 1700. And as we examined the um, religious history, we still had lessons dealing with Judaism and Islam and what was taking place in those religious groups or faiths at that time. But we started to notice what was more referred to as the Reformation Movement. Now, the Reformation Movement, to try and to summarize that or to, to put it in a nutshell, was where individuals realized that Catholicism has departed from what it was supposed to be. It was no longer the New Testament church. The difference was is that they, they could see hope and they wanted to bring about change. And perhaps I could make great discussion as far with an individual as far as whether or not uh, the way they went about it was right versus wrong. But that would be for another lesson. But what they saw hope was was that they wanted to reform. They just wanted to change things around and steer it back into the right direction. And so we had lessons like about Martin Luther and what he did, and certainly we had lessons about the 95 Thesis. The 95 Thesis was much like when he nailed it to the church door, uh, was much like when today we might would take a paper that we want to be posted and, and put it upon a bulletin board. His goal was not to lead people away from Catholicism. His goal was just to try and steer Catholicism back towards New Testament Christianity. Now, just a side note, I don't endorse all of his teachings, but, but his heart and seeing the departures, trying to recognize them, bring them to people's attention, and to bring about change is admirable. And we noticed that last year. It was during this time that we started seeing a lot of uprisings. Uh, there were those that had the problems with the Crusades that we had examined in 2018. Brother Ronnie Whittemore did a great job with that. And they were concerned about the physical aspect of what was taking place. And so what they started trying to do was to, to reform, to make change. It's out of this that eventually you would actually see Protestantism take place. And we started seeing and examining the influence of people like John Calvin. For clarity's sake, I don't endorse John Calvin nor his teachings. And I encourage you to go back to the 2019 lectureship that you can find on YouTube or the book that's on our website. And you'll see why we don't endorse those teachings, starting with the basic concept of tulip doctrine. Now, most of Protestantism follows the tulip doctrine in some form, maybe not all of it, but in some form they follow after it because that was produced. The Reformation movement led away from Catholicism, creating Protestantism. And so what we really have is two groups at this point in time. You have those that practice Christianity through the Catholic Church, and then you have those through Protestantism. Now, again, clarification, you still have Greek Orthodox, you still have Neo-Nestorianism, and other faiths that are out there, but these are the dominant groups. The problem is they had doctrines that were unbiblical. They did not go far enough in their change, and they continued to teach false doctrines. One of the things that we can think about is the concept of inherited sin, and a great lecture was produced last year and delivered to us dealing with the concept of why inherited sin is wrong. 
So that brings us to the final lesson of last year. And that's a lot of history that I just covered, but again, you have lectures you can listen to. Charles Blair left our lectureship last year with why ref reforming or why the Reformation movement was not enough. And so we come to this year to try and to examine of what is the Restoration Movement. And the Restoration Movement, if you wanted to define it, perhaps could be a little challenging. I started looking up and I have different quotes that define what the Restoration Movement is. See, it depends on your perspective. Because while I am a member of the body of Jesus Christ, the Church of Christ at Milestone, we need to realize there are religious organizations out there that still try and stake some claim to the Restoration Movement. They view it differently. And so they would identify it separately than what you and I might would. But what we see the Restoration Movement being is a time period roughly between 17 to 1900. I know that's a broad range there, but I'm not going to split hairs over, over dates but roughly between 17 to 1900, in which we see people that had followed the Protestant system. Not the Catholic Church, but the Protestant system that brought about division in and of itself. Because suddenly you start having those people that were calling themselves everything from uh, a Lutheran, which even though Martin Luther had desired that no man should call them, themselves after him, you had those that would call themselves Calvinist, Baptist, Methodist, all sorts of denominational names. And you had people that as they saw this understood that passages like 1 Corinthians, that I would have no divisions among you, that you be of the same mind and be of the same judgment. And so what their desire was, was to seek that unity. They wanted to put aside these titles. Now the reason we call it a movement because it wasn't by one person, it wasn't at one time that we could say right here is when it happened. It was a culmination of a lot of different men and individuals. It was a culmination of many years of development that would lead about to restoring the New Testament church out of the desire to seek to be that one church that Jesus promised he would build in Matthew chapter 16 and that we see established in Acts chapter 2. It was their desire to seek authority that they started to say things like, give me book, chapter, and verse. Let's call Bible things by Bible names. They encouraged individuals to study and to, to seek the authority to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent where the Bible is silent. Now there's a lot of contributing factors to this. Certainly you could go to the reforms that were taking place politically in places like Scotland that would lead to much migration to the United States. Certainly the United States played a role in this. The freedom of speech, the freedom of religion allowed a platform that would uh, expedite and would ignite on fire even more the restoration movement. Some will get into a debate whether or not the Stone-Campbell movement and the restoration movement are the same. I'm not here today to settle that. But certainly it had a part. See, we need to realize that the church has always existed, but in many places it had been lost. And so what their attempt was, was let's restore. I think a lot about that concept of restoration. Because to restore something is you have to have the original. It has to exist previously. I think a lot about the, the trucks that my grandpa drove. One of them was a little white S10. And the other grandpa drove a, a little a blue Silverado. My uncle still has that white S10. In fact, on Facebook just this week, he was commenting about it may not look the greatest, it might not be expensive, but please don't bang your uh, doors into it in the parking lot. Because, see, that truck is special to him. In fact, if he has the capability, I would not be surprised if he would restore it. In restoring it, what he would try and do is go back to the original. I can see the original in my head. <laughs> 
a nice white coat of paint. He wouldn't paint it blue because my grandpa's truck wasn't blue. It was white. He wouldn't put leather seats in it because it wasn't leather seats. It was brown vinyl. That's what he had put in there. He wouldn't put a V8 engine in it because it was an S10. He might restore the original engine. See, that's what the restoration movement desired to do. It wanted to go back and just look into the New Testament and to, to see what does the New Testament church do? And so as they did so, they would see that they funded the work of the church through free will offerings. And so that's what they started to do is to take up collections. Those collections were done on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16. So they did it on the first day of the week. They restored the concept of five acts of worship because they read of the New Testament church doing five acts of worship. They started going back and, and examining everything that they did and said, we will do this because this is what the New Testament church did. And in doing so, they restored the New Testament church. That's the restoration movement. Now, a few things before we close the lecture I think ought to be uh, considered. It's not wrong to appreciate what these individuals did and, and the part they played in the restoration movement. Now, I make that point because sometimes there are those that are criticized and say we elevate these men. There's a difference between elevating the men and appreciating the role that they played. Certainly, my father and my grandfathers play an important part of my life, and I respect them greatly for the things that they did for me. I am very appreciative for the men like Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, even though they weren't the only men, and I hope this lectureship will show that you have men like Barton W. Stone, and you have a lot of other individuals that played a great part in bringing about the restoration movement. It's not wrong to appreciate the men that played a part in the restoration movement, to appreciate that they led the way to help restore the New Testament church so that we can be a part of it today is not wrong. What would be wrong is if we make these men our standard. If we start teaching things just because Alexander Campbell did, just because David Lipscomb said something, just because Barton W. Stone said something, just because McGarvey said something, that makes it right. These men are not our standards. We can appreciate them. We can respect them but let's not make them our standards. Furthermore, I believe it's very important when we think about the restoration movement is to consider whether or not it still exists. I realize that is an area of debate and to some people can be an area of contention. I pray that it will not be between me and you, but I will try and draw this thought to some conclusions in our minds. Is the restoration movement still continuing today? I would say it depends. It is continuing in certain areas in certain parts because there are congregations, there are places that they are not following after New Testament completely. And so what they may be doing is just like these men that we are going to be studying about in this series. What they're doing is they're going to the New Testament and they're sitting down with people and they're studying and they're trying to get where they are to go back to New Testament Christianity. And in that sense, the restoration movement is still taking place. In other places, it could be that perhaps they're doing everything the New Testament church is doing. I would argue that it's still taking place because it's in what we would call a maintenance mode. Let me explain. I have a friend of mine. He loves Trans Ams. He's a Trans Am collector and restorer, and he got some cars that are just absolutely remarkable. Still remember the night he let me drive one of them in a Christmas parade. That was so neat. But he has these cars that he has restored. And as he has restored them, he doesn't get to a point that he says, and now I'm done. There is an ongoing maintenance that he does from making sure that the tires stay in good condition, back like the originals making sure that the batteries stay charged, the oil stays changed. And for that car to stay restored, he has to continue to take the principles of restoration and apply them. And in that way, we continue the restoration movement today by maintaining the New Testament church. I hope this series of lectures will help you. I hope that through this lecture, you've seen why it is we're studying what we are. You can see the importance and that you can take away from this 
what we intend to help you to be able to better walk with God. Remember, these men have played an important part. These religious organizations that are not the church exist. But what's important is that we are part of the New Testament church, the one of which Jesus died so that he could establish. That was established in Acts chapter 2 because it tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 it's the one of which he is the head. And after all, he's a savior of that church, the one that is the body of Jesus Christ.